Thank you for listening to the Dog Trainers Podcast, a podcast created by dog trainers for dog trainers or anyone who's ever fallen in love with man's best friend. Episode 36, Trainers to the Rescue, featuring Bobby Giraffeshark. Hey, everybody. Welcome back, and thank you so much for listening to the Dog Trainers Podcast. My name is Mariano, here with Brent Labrada and a very special guest that we'll be announcing here in just a couple minutes. Before we do, though, we want to let you guys know that you can find us on all major social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, all by searching Dog Trainers Podcast. And it's all one word, Dog Trainers Podcast, as well as all major uh, podcast platforms for those of you who'd rather listen to us in straight audio version, iTunes, SoundCloud, all that good stuff. And I just want to give one last quick shout out to a few of those cities who have been showing us love lately. So What's up, guys, in Garner, North Carolina, Columbus, Ohio. And this this last episode, we got a ton of support from Canada and Australia. Thank you guys so, so much. And with that being said, I'm going to kick it over right to Brent because we've got someone who we're very excited to talk to. Go ahead, man. Right on. What's up, everybody? Hope you guys had a wonderful week. Um, so our special guest today is someone very, very dear to my heart. Um, you guys hear me talk about him over the last 35 episodes. Um, his name is Bobby Darafshar. He's my mentor of many, many years. Um, a dog trainer and master of his craft in his own right. Um, but this is a guy who definitely over the last many, many years taught me not just dog training. He taught me business. He taught me uh, how to kind of channel my passion for rescue. He taught me about nonprofit work. He taught me about uh, personal life growth. He taught me about a bunch of things as most mentors do. Uh, so we're really honored to have him here uh, on the podcast. And we're going to kind of dive into his story because one thing that I always loved about his story was this guy, um, you know, he'll tell you a little bit more himself, but this guy was a, is a self-made man, definitely a self-made man, someone really, really inspiring, a very passionate, um, someone who is multifaceted with many skills and many talents. And honestly, I couldn't have asked for a better mentor. So that being said, we're going to go introduce uh, Bobby Durauschar. Bobby, how are you today? Hi, guys. How are you guys doing? Good, good. good. How are you? Good seeing you, Mario. Good to see you. It's been a while. Uh, <laughs> thank you for having me. And, you know, the way you talked about me, maybe I should have charged you. I, I know, right? <laughs> for all the years of I therapy. I guess I threw up my money somehow. Mm -hmm. But thank you for having me. I'm here to answer any question you guys have. Perfect. Perfect. Well, I think one thing we wanted to dive into, Bobby, um, I mean, let's just start from the beginning. Your story, where you started. Um, you know, it, it's great having these special guests on because we get to see where everyone starts. And it's so funny because even though everyone has different origin stories, there's definitely overlap when it comes to passion and it comes to how we got started. So let's just let's start with you. I guess let's start by from the very, very beginning. Go ahead. Well, as a child living in, a, I would say at this time is a third world country, Iran. Uh, dogs, they have no right. They were against religion. They call them filthy. And there were strays all over, and the, nobody cared about him. And it's so funny because here, when you see a dog, when you kneel down, they run to you and kiss you back home. If you kneel down, they would run because somebody would pick up a rock and hit it. Mm. So since I was a little kid, I always had passion for dogs. So every day I'll come home with a puppy from gutters or something loose on the street. And my poor dad, God bless, he will take him in, then he will try to find him a home or has to deal with me crying for God knows how long. <laughs> so this is starts when I was probably around five, six years old. And based on at a very young age, I think I've been told my dog saved my life. I fell in the pool and almost drowned and he helped me up. What kind of dog was that? Uh, it was a little fluffy dog, call him Snowy. So he kept me right on the edge of the pool till my parents realize I'm missing. Oh my gosh. So this is when I was about around two years old. So I always had a passion to, I felt I'm a voice of the dogs. So um, at the young age of a teenager, anywhere I went, I had 15, 20 stray dogs follow me. And to be honest, I would have a huge amount of food in my dish. Then I will sneak out and I will feed the dogs outside. Mm -hmm. Till my dad with the butcher shop, they make the deal to give me food for the dogs. Right. So uh, go forward. Uh, always loved animals. Always had dogs at home. Uh, my dogs were everything for me. And till I came to U.S., which I was 21 years old. And I came to a different country with a different culture, with different expectation. And not even be able to communicate with anybody based on lack of language. 
Mm -hmm. So for years, I want to have a dog, but I couldn't have it because I had to work in a factory. I work as a minimum wage. Yeah. I there had there wasn't, a lot, of, there wasn't was a lot of job opportunities. It wasn't a lot of job crazy. Yeah, it wasn't a lot of job And couldn't communicate. So, yeah. but that passion stayed and stayed and stayed with me till I got a little bit older, uh, be able to make some money. Then I got my first dogs actually in the U.S. They were Rottweilers. Mm. Uh, I got a puppy for my girlfriend, and then my neighbor had another one, and they liked the way I treat my dogs and train them uh, by myself without not much of a knowledge, just experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I end up to having their puppy as well uh, based on their living estate, and they couldn't have more than two dogs with them, and that was their third dog. Mm. Uh, Shadow was my baby and Baron was an adopted baby, which I was in love with him since this puppy was around two months old. Mm -hmm. He was a beautiful, beautiful pup. How old were you at this time, Bobby? At this time, I'm around 30 years old, 29, 30 years old. So you moved to a country at 21. You don't even know the language. You're working these basic jobs, you know, because it's, you can't communicate, you know, to, to everybody. What were you doing in that meantime? You went to go, you, you, you were taking well, English classes. No, no, no. I did. I, what I did, I went to work around five o'clock in the morning. It was a 60 miles drive every day. Come home around five o'clock. Then at night I went to ESL. English is a second language. Nice. And then I end up to go to Pierce College at night. Mm -hmm. And my hardest time was keeping my eyes open at eight o'clock in a class. <laughs> I was willing to pay thousands of dollars to just take a nap for five minutes. So <laughs> that's how I started it. Then I started working for a different company and I started working as a salesperson mm -hmm. with a very, very broken language. Mm -hmm. uh, but somehow, somewhere people liked me and mm -hmm. I was successful and I started making money. Yeah, well, I think I think one thing that anyone who knows you is that they know how good you are with people. And so I'm sure even if there was a language barrier, uh, <laughs> there you, you, you could you could figure out a way to communicate and connect with somebody. And that was my first experience at my sales job because somebody told me and he goes, Bobby, uh, you talked to me for half an hour and I was selling stereo and he goes, to be honest with you, I did not understand the world you said. <laughs> but your energy made me buy it. And my manager looked at me and he goes, you're going to be a top sales in this company. <laughs> so that was my first We just got to teach you English, kid. Exactly. We just got to teach you. <laughs> so, oh, I knew all the bad words, just not a good word. So yeah. <laughs> it always, even kids learn the bad words first, it seems. Yeah, that's <laughs> any second language, for sure. For sure. Okay. So, 21, so between 21 to 30, um, you worked for a couple jobs, you were a salesman, and then you decided it, or you ended up, these two Rottweilers fell in your lap. Well, I, we were doing like everyday hike. I got to know a lot of people hiking with me mm -hmm. and my dogs were well, well behaved. Mm -hmm. And I want to do sports with my dogs. So, um, I found a club, which it was a Shitson club. And I went there and visit them for nights after nights, just sit back and watch them. And I learn and ask questions. And one day I brought my dogs over. Do you remember the name of the Shitsen Club? Uh, it was, um, they were in Camarillo. So it was, I believe was Camarillo Shitsen Club or something like that. That was so many years ago. Yeah. They, they don't exist right now. Yeah. So... When I brought my dogs, all the other trainers and the people working on the club, they really want to see how my dog's doing. So they did the evaluation and they liked what they saw. So they invite me to join in. So I pay my annual tuition to buy the equipments. And I start being a handler for my dogs. Mm -hmm. And I learned to be an agitator. Then I start doing competition. So... Uh, that was a different world, and I enjoyed it. Even it was eight o'clock till ten thirty at night, and after that we all went and have a in and out on the way. Nice. And, uh, so we got to know each other, and working for the company, which the way I got treated from people, I got very disappointed, and I decided to actually become a dog trainer. Nice. So I put all my focus and all my saving 
towards working with a couple trainers from the Shitsen Club by hiring them and start learning a little bit more about how you actually effectively can work with the dogs on that level, which it was Mm -hmm. mostly about uh, working with the dogs at the high prey drive, Mm -hmm. love to bite, and teaching the bite was the easiest things. Teaching them to let go was one of the hardest. (laughs) I tell people that all the time. Yeah, Yeah. so we hear that a lot. But it was the greatest challenge, loved it. And at this time, I had no clue, even living for... 10 years almost in California, I had no clue about shelter system. I had no clue about overpopulation. I had no clue about a number of the animals they die at the shelter. So all my focus was right breeders, right working dogs, working dogs. The traditional working dogs. Obedience obedience on an advanced level. So that was my focus. Mm -hmm. And so we were working with a pinch collar. We were working with the shock collars. We were working with everything. And in 94, after earthquake, uh, what happened was one of our hiking friends uh, lost their dog based off the wall claps and it got mm-hmm. out. And I end up to go to the shelter in West Valley. And what I saw, it changed everything. Uh, a shelter had room for maybe 200 animals. They had over 800 Wow. And they all were fighting over food. There were blood all over the place. There were and this is dogs feces suffering from and each each run. They had yeah. like twelve, you know, dogs in there. There were six and mm-hmm. unaltered and mm-hmm. uh, and all scared and and so real, real quick. So those of you guys who and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Bobby. Those of you guys who aren't from Los Angeles, in 1994 there was one of the biggest earthquakes in California ever, which destroyed. A huge, it was actually down, it's actually in the city that I live <laughs> in, in, and I North, lost my house. in Northridge, right? Um, and so not only was it a huge, devastating historical event in, in, in Los Angeles, but a lot of animals suffered from this as well. Um, and uh, yeah, just wanted to let people know ab- about that. Well, the story on that, and, oh, and also, real quick, sorry, and also the Los Angeles shelter system mm-hmm. was shit. <laughs> well, shit. I mean, how many shelters did they have back then? Uh, Los Angeles has six shelters. Now they do. How long? No, they, they had six shelters. Oh, they had they six always shelters. Had six they shelters. were just shitty Los shelters. Angeles. Yeah. And, yeah, everything was very, very old. Everything was rusted and, mm-hmm. you know, it was in and out. And it just yeah. uh, disgusting. Uh-huh. Uh, absolutely everything was so old. And euthanasia room was the largest part of the shelter. Mm-hmm. So that's wow. the sad part of it. Uh, so one of the things actually happened on 94 earthquake, uh, my little sister was living with me. I live in the beautiful house with a nice view, which I moved in probably like seven months before that. Oh. And when the earthquake hits, um, I grabbed my sister. We went under the doorway in the hallway and we're standing there. So I called my dogs and Baron, the dog was adopted from my neighbor mm-hmm. uh, with the highest training. I'm calling him and he's not coming. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we lost electricity. We cannot see anything. Finally, when it's almost stopped, I ran out with my sister and looked for him. So if he ran outside and I see him just sitting by the front door and looking at me. Mm. Uh, at this time, earthquake stopped and we start hitting the aftershocks. And I walk back in. Actually, the area we were standing, the whole place, the roof collapsed. No. Wow. So... Then I look at it as this is the second time my dog actually <laughs> saved my life. Wow. And so many times happen. And it just, that's one of the reason I felt the way I felt about this beautiful creature, which a lot of people, mm-hmm. they really don't understand what they are. Right. The true of dogs. Yeah. So when I went to the shelter, even I didn't have a place to live. I was living in my truck. Uh, my dogs, they were living on the back shell and I was sleeping in front and go to my mom's house and take shower once every other day. But mostly I would go to shelter and try to separate animals, wash them, relax them a little bit, walk them a little bit. And the experience I developed changed my whole life. I realized I need to help these animals. I mm-hmm. realized uh, I need to be voice of these creatures. I realized 
and the staff working with the shelter, they are they have no passion about helping the situation. Mm-hmm. Is nothing except nine to five job for them. Right. And they just they don't care if a dog dies. They have no clue how people feel when they're losing their animals and not because they were bad people they really didn't have an understanding because they were dealing with such a huge overpopulation which we save two dogs and nine of them come in at the same exact day so wow so we could not keep up with the intake uh so I taught a lot and I stayed for six months every day I was at the shelter and not seeing any clients or anything because the whole city was down kind of. And, and this every, is all post earthquake. This, this is, is all, all right. Still after, the city's yeah, rebuilding. rebuilding. So yeah. a lot of the people, they found their dogs, but they didn't have a home. They didn't have a fencing anymore. So situation was bad. So I went to general manager uh, at the time, and uh, Mr. Gary Olson. Hmm. And I told them, how about you guys are closed Sunday and Monday? And Sunday is the biggest family day. People go to church after that, the whole family together. Saturday, a lot of people work. Some people with different religion, they're not working on Saturday. Why don't we open Sunday as well and have another day, middle of the week, to be closed? Hmm. Uh, unfortunately, There were so many walls were in front of me. And every time I talked to him, I got rejected based of staff need to go to church. uh, We cannot pay overtime, liability of the issues and go on and on and on. So I start going to City Hall, to the meeting with the council people and bring them up. And the city attorney didn't want us to do anything. So I said, if you guys not going to open Sunday, how about allow us volunteer taking animals to the public because a lot of people, they don't feel comfortable come to the shelter. Right. Mm-hmm. And I evaluate the right animals for the adoption. I get the location. I will put a volunteer system together. And finally, after around four months with help of a couple other volunteers, uh, they said, okay, you can take two trucks, but you have to take a course to driving the truck, no problem, Mm -hmm. and how to talk to the radio, no Mm -hmm. problem. And And these are like city-issued animal control uh, trucks. Yes, (laughs) and also you cannot touch money, so you have to have one person from the city employee to take care of the money, Mm -hmm. and we're not going to pay for that person. And you can do 12 dogs, two trucks, and one truck, and each truck takes six animals. Mm. And six cats you can take to adoption. Mm. So we said, no problem. We had a receptionist, which we went and told them, I said, if you don't go to church, how about you volunteer, and we will pay you on the table. Mm -hmm. So she agreed. Mm. And the day before on Saturday, we went and select 12 dogs and we washed them, put a ribbon on them, got the cats, brushed them, take care of everything. And I had around 25 volunteers at that time. Wow. So I went to the largest pet shop we had in the valley and I asked him if they allow us to have a pet adoption. They accepted because we were a good clients for my business. And they said I can use the back parking lot. Uh, one of our volunteers, Judy Levine, which it was doing publicity as profession, uh, start sending press release to all the TV channels and the news. And in the morning, we went and pick up the animals, load them up, and we pulled into this parking lot. And Brent, I gotta tell you, I felt I'm a Brad Pitt. <laughs> every TV station. You look station, like Al Pacino, but you thought you were Brad Pitt. Every TV station. <laughs> <laughs> every reporter, every newspaper, cameras all over the place, and public just waiting for unloading and putting puppy oh my pants. Gosh. So anyway, within an hour and a half, all of our animals got adopted. We had to take him back to get him spay and neuter. Mm. And we come back with all the animals. We left all the volunteers, and I load up 
and now they're 12 and now they're six. <laughs> nice. You're like, let's ride this wave. <laughs> uh, the officer in charge stopped me and he goes, no, they told me 12. I said, no, they told me 12 at, at a time. time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that day we adopted 84 animals. Whoa. Wow. Wow. And it's funny because end of the day, six o'clock afternoon in summertime, Every one of our volunteers, we are laying on the ground, exhausted, completely exhausted, but our smile you could not miss. Mm. So got home around nine o'clock at night and my home phone rings. Those days we had pagers. We didn't have cell phones. Yeah. What are pagers? I'm just joking. <laughs> Ask your doctor. Are those like, they will know are those like text? <laughs> what is that? So anyway, <laughs> so I pick up the phone. I thought he's one of my volunteers. And the first thing comes up and he goes, Bobby. I go, yes. It goes, this is Gary Olson. The general manager like, general of manager LA Animal, of Animal Service. Services. <laughs> and I'm like, holy shit, I'm fired. <laughs> You're a volunteer. So, yeah. I volunteers. <laughs> so we, I said, what can I do for you? And he goes, well, uh, I just... Put, you know, talk to our mayor. And he was very, very impressed. And I want to ask you, can you continue this work hmm. and do it every weekend? Amazing. And you will have our support. And I'm like, not only I will do that, but Saturday also I would like to hold the open house at the shelter. So hang up the phone. I'm excited. I'm watching news. Awesome. Channel 2, Channel 4, Channel 5, Channel 7, Channel 9, Channel 11, Channel 13. Uh, they're all talking about this pet adoption. Amazing. Right? So we start doing that. At the end of that year, of, uh, year, we dropped the euthanasia for city of Los Angeles by 9%. Wow. And I had over 900 volunteers. Whoa. And I had six shelters. I was a volunteer coordinator and a pet adoption coordinator for six shelters, which means I had the key and they give me a badge to be able to go and select animals and put which one is actually going for adoption so they would be safe mm. for that adoption week and uh, open houses. So the whole mentality of the staff, they got so excited because... Think about it. Even they had to do their job and they're used to putting animals down, but still they had some favorites. Right. So you don't know how many times uh, the ACA will come over and they go, I really love this dog. Can you take him to adoption? Can you find him a home? Mm -hmm. And that developed such a strong relationship with us as a volunteer and mm -hmm. the staff of the shelter and bring such a positive energy mm -hmm. And to a point, they will call me and they go, this jerk brought the dog in. They tell me the dog is aggressive. Because if you bring a dog to shelter, says the dog bite, they had to put him to sleep within two hours. And that wow. two hours was based of the person can change his mind, mm. not for adoption. Mm. So I had to get involved with it. And there were times I would just go on the back and cry and come back in and smile and start doing adoption. Mm -hmm. Or so many times you will see me and somebody bringing animals and lying and the animals were not aggressive and they were lying. Me and him had a huge, you know, a challenge of a conversation, I would say. <laughs> you mean a fight? Uh, to a point, <laughs> to a a fight. point uh, they kind of throw me out of the shelter a couple of times for a short period of time. Or I would ask him to go outside and meet me on the street, not right. at the public, uh, the facility of the right uh, los angeles properties yeah. so that's how i started <laughs> mobile pet adoption for three years that's what i did yeah and then they hired two people to take my position and still i was handling the mobile pet adoption wow. at middle of this i realized the number of animals we worked so hard to find a home for mm -hmm. uh was the ratio was so much less than the number entered to the shelter mm. So I came up with the idea of developing a nonprofit as educating the public. Mm -hmm. So that's how New Leash on Life was born. At this time, I met my wife, which was my girlfriend. I sat down at dinner and I go, I want to do this. And she goes, I completely support you. So we developed a nonprofit called New Leash on Life Animal Rescue. And 
which unfortunately is not at this time is not anything as good as used to be. Mm -hmm. And we developed these programs. So I talked to Jim, the new general manager and I asked them if we can do free seminars for anybody who want to return animals or anybody adopt the animals on every shelter. So every week we would have gone to one shelter uh, from furthest away from each other. So one day I'm in the Valley, another day I'm in South Central, another day I'm in North Hollywood, mm -hmm. another time I'm in North Central. So if they miss it, they can come back with later. And I bought chairs and I bought all this stuff I need, to do's and don'ts, how to housebreak your dog, important of SPN neutering, important of a training. So we developed that program and it worked very well. Mm. And we've been busy. We really, like every Saturday morning. I bought a van through my company and drove so it. It's yeah, everything. Everything that I mean, the beautiful part about what I'm hearing is just how you kept pushing the needle forward. You kept really trying to. Well, you got to find solution, Brent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because very easily you can give up. Yeah. Life is easy when you want to give up. Right. But the fact of the matter, every problem, there is a solution for it. Right. It's just a matter of put your head together. Yep. Don't be as stressful. Don't yep. be too emotional. Yep. And find out how you can actually solve that problem. Yep. So when you see somebody from Iran without speaking the language in the background of a Muslim, which I never followed because as a Muslim, I'm not allowed to even touch a dog yep. or own a dog. Wow. So... Then you come back and you make such a change on the country, which is well advanced, well educated, uh -huh. and a lot more budget. Yeah. So anybody can make that difference. It's yeah. just a matter of how much they're willing to do it. And the did drive. I want to get up at six o'clock in the morning, load up a van, and go to South Central and deal with the gangs and convince them to swing and neuter or don't dog fight or? Mm. Uh, rather fighting the dog to make $50, how about become a trainer and make mm -hmm. $100 an mm -hmm. hour? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you will see spark in their eyes. Right. right okay. Right, right. So my job was to be an educator, uh, not necessarily because I want to be an educator, mm -hmm. uh, because I had a passion for what I get out of that teaching. Yeah. 